get started. Um, so uh, for anybody who just walked in, so uh, Ian the Great Scope as of like a few minutes ago uh, is the deployment assignment. You have about two weeks to get it done. Uh, oh, more details in a minute, so I'll, I'll stop there. Um, uh, let's see, the midterm review I was going to do today, I didn't feel like I was ready for it, so I'm going to wait till Tuesday, uh, but we'll talk about uh, kind of the stuff I pulled out and actually all the instructional team kind of pulled out as uh, that we thought was interesting. Um, and we'll talk about that on Tuesday. Um, and then uh, the other big note is just my office hours are moved again tomorrow because somebody again scheduled over them. Uh, so 2.30 to 4.30 tomorrow, uh, hopefully if you need to come by, uh, it still works. Um, I do try to have the Zoom open as well. Uh, so if that's more convenient. Uh, the thing is that if there's someone in my office, I often won't see the Zoom. So uh, make sure you like say something probably loudly to try to get my attention if I'm not responding. Um, okay, so uh, as I said, it was released now. Uh, it'll be due on the 9th, which is actually a Saturday at midnight, uh, just to try to give you the weekend if you want to work on it then. Um, obviously, you can turn it in early if you like it. But uh, so everything I'm going to cover here is like in theory in the grade scope assignment itself. But uh, I wanted to give some color uh, because I think some of this can be a little confusing. <clears throat> okay, so the first one, GitHub repo and branch. So you may or may not have ever noticed this, but if you are in the main branch of a repo, uh, it, the branch name does not appear in the URL. If you switch branches, it changes and it appears in the URL. So just make sure. When you're cutting and pasting from the URL, make sure you get the branch okay, that you're on, because I don't want to go in there and look at main and say, you haven't done anything all semester because you've all been on some other branch, right? That makes sense? So just be cautious of that because it's a very easy mistake to make. Uh, okay, so the working URL, this is where your application is deployed, okay? So um, on the former, everyone's on GitHub, the best of my knowledge, right? Everyone's got code in GitHub, in theory at least. Okay. Oh, that's and basically part of the point of this exercise is get stuff pushed to GitHub. Okay. Uh, you should be doing it all the way along. You should think of GitHub in some ways as your backup in the cloud, right? So uh, you know, computers fail all the time. So make sure you you know are pushing regularly to GitHub. That way you're not going to lose your code. Uh, the working URL, so the working version of the application. For some of you, uh, this song comes quickly to mind, right? This is only sort of kind of applicable. So uh, if you feel like it's not applicable or you're not sure how to deliver on this, come and talk to us. Okay, we'll talk about it individually. This is a, it's kind of like a guideline that I, you know, I have to say something. Um, and it's, it's true for most of you. All right, does everybody know what I mean by that? All right, cool. All right, next one. Um, and this is probably the, the hardest, well, maybe not the hardest piece of work. I mean, setting up the actual deployment, stuff like that is a little bit. Um, but this is also important. So you should have a readme file in your repo no matter what, okay, first and foremost. It is common for two pieces of data that I also call out here, deployment and contributing, to be in the readme. But if it's like sufficiently sophisticated or complicated or whatever, people will pull it out of the README and put it in another file called deployment, for example, or contributing. Um, and I'll talk more about those in a second. Um, but so I expect to find in that document the if I wanted to be a developer in the project, what do I have to do? What do I have to set up? Okay. If I wanted to run this application in production, what do I have to do? What do I have to set up? Okay. That's what deployment is here. Um, and then uh, if you have are working on a project that has a prior instance, and so they already have a decent deployment doc, I'm going to be way more picky about typos, errors, uh, in, you know, inconsistencies or whatever about that deployment doc. So 
if if it's already there, that doesn't mean it's good enough. Okay, so just make sure you go through it, make sure it's accurate, make sure it's including kind of all those things. Um, and then lastly, uh, kind of in the same vein, if you already have a deployment guide, I'm expecting to see a contributing guide. Okay. The contributing guide is basically like, if I wanted to join your project and do some stuff, what do you expect me to do? Okay. So the last thing I'll say, and this has uh, been one of the really nice things about GitHub, is GitHub has kind of like established very strongly these conventional names. Okay. So on a repo in GitHub, if you have a file called readme.md, it will just display that file right in the repo, right? You've all seen this, I'm sure, but that's not something anybody sets up. It's just magic based on naming convention. Okay. So let's see. Sorry, I have three. Oh, so there's basically like five files that have a very strong, maybe six, strong naming convention. First one's README. Everything should always have a README. And notice the casing, casing matters. Second is um, license which will not have an extension almost ever, okay? But again, it's all caps, uh, you should have a license. Um, then you have kind of three or four that are kind of more optional. So like I was kind of saying is deployment and contributing. Sometimes they're just writing the readme, sometimes they're separate. If they're separate, they should be named this way. The other one, which I think you all have, is another one called contributors, which is, like on the face of it, it's meant to be a thanks to all the people who have put code into it. Um, but a lot of organizations use it to automate access as well, including Spark. Okay, so you should already have a contributors. It shouldn't need to be modified. Uh, so largely leave that one off. Make sense? Questions? Okay. All right. Question four. Okay. So this one, I think, is where it gets potentially sticky in the sense that I do not expect your projects to be done. Okay, think of it more like a checkpoint, okay? So we're going to be looking at the same requirements with the exception of workflow, excuse me, as is in the original syllabus for the project. But this whole thing is going to be graded like a homework, okay? So the impact of it is not very high because I'm going to go in there and I'm going to say, okay, you know, your code quality organization, you've got a zero, right? It needs to be much, much better. So yes, it can have an impact. So make sure you go and clean this stuff up. But I do not expect, I'm not going to rate it on, when I say functionality, have you actually delivered everything that you said you were going to deliver? Because you're not supposed to have done that yet. Does that make sense? So like I said, I just want to caution you, it's not, it's not meant to be done, but it is meant to be good, and it's meant to have real stuff, OK? <clears throat> Because uh, I know there's at least some of the teams in here who have maybe not even yet pushed any code to GitHub. Okay, this makes me highly uncomfortable. All right, the last thing is, um, I don't know, this is a, a little bit of a personal belief, um, but like issues should not always, or should not be considered ne necessarily bad things, okay? They can often be used as a way to track work that needs to be done. Okay, or, you know, request for enhancement or, uh, you know, things like that. So just because it's called an issue, do not associate that in your brain with bad. Okay, so when I say I expect to find some, like this, if, if I feel like you're deeply engaged in the project, you're going to find issues. So that might be an idea that you have for long in the future. It might be a... Um, something that you're working on. It might be a bug that you know is there, but you're going to get back to it later for whatever reason, which is perfectly valid. Okay. So I'm a little on the fence of this. I'm not really going to grade for this, but this is one of those things that's going to kind of contribute to code quality and organization in a sense. Okay. All right. And then lastly, I want to see continuous deployment. This is another one where depending on your project, this might be weird. Okay, so if you don't feel like there's a straight line route to, you know, things that you know how to do, right, and getting a deployment to happen, um, come and talk to us, okay? So we can help you figure that out uh, or, or kind of find a satisfactory condition, okay? Um, because this, you know, it's a little project dependent, but I need to ask the class the same question, right? So 
but just come and talk to us for anything that might be uh, confusing or difficult or whatever about that. So, all right, any questions? That was basically all I wanted to cover on that. Okay, so like I said, you have about two weeks to do it. Hopefully you've already made some progress in this direction. Um, like I said, I think many of you already have something like an appointment guide already, uh, so that should make it easier. Um, and, uh, you know, office hours are your friend. All right, so there's my announcements. Again, uh, so just my, the big one is my office hours are changed for tomorrow. And now we will do something completely different. Uh, so, sorry, I'm gonna load it up. And put it in the right direction. All right, so we're gonna do a Kahoot. Um, <laughs> So I'm calling this a quiz. Um, you know, basically, I don't know if I'm really gonna score it, um, but this is to try to show that you have um, kind of done the reading that we asked you to do. Um, so this is kind of fair warning that, that the readings that are in the syllabus are real uh, and that I will maybe have a quiz that counts for something in the future. Um, but this one is going to be less that uh, for a couple of reasons. One, it covers a few things that uh, are not in the reading. Uh, so, but I thought were important to cover anyway. Um, and uh, yeah, so that'd be fun. Um, yeah, so I'm sorry, I meant to mention this at the beginning. Please try to use something close to your real name. Uh, so that way uh, I can kind of get a sense of how y'all did. I run a conference where the last event of the conference is usually this big trivia contest. Um, and the past couple of years, we've done it virtually, right? So I did it as a Kahoot. Um, but we give out prizes for the winners, right? Like, you know, material like swag stuff. Half the people had just put in like random, you know, random jokey names or whatever. I'm like, what am I supposed to do with this? How do I, how do I give you a prize? You didn't tell me who you are. Um, so yeah, it'd be nice if Kahoot could have a like public name and private name. Um, but to the best of my knowledge, I don't, I don't know of any tool actually that has that. <laughs> All right, anybody not in? All right, cool, so we'll start. <clears throat> and there's also no control separation, so it's kind of like... All right, I hope you appreciate the sparkles. I picked that theme myself. Uh, I thought it was fancy. All right, so who should reject PRs that have broken code in them? Next, if I could align this, that the answers were at the top. I thought. Sorry, how about the answer? Oh, let's see. Whoa, boy. Nope. Everybody had their answers in, but it's apparently the problem or something. Oh, that legible ish? Yeah. All right. Um, okay, so this is the right answer, right? Uh, you, like, as much as possible, uh, you should not be dealing with PRs at all. Okay. So, what you should be doing is that what should happen is a PR comes in. Does everybody know what a PR is? Somebody tell me what a PR is. Okay, what does that mean? They're requesting to put your code into the main repository. So, so it's actually the reverse of that. What you're actually saying, I mean, you're right, but it's you're actually requesting that they pull your code into the thing. And that's why it's called a pull request. I always think it sounds really backwards, right? But you, that's really what you're doing is you're requesting that they pull in your code. So it's a little easier. Remember that way, I think. Um, so uh, what should be happening? is that I do some development. I do a pull request against the original project. Um, the original project uh, has some automation that runs some tests and validates that my code does its thing, okay? Then there is a human component where the humans come in uh, and it's usually two maintainers of the project uh, will write something like LGTM, which is looks good to me. Uh, and once a bot sees two of those, it will consider that code acceptable to take into the system. 
and it will do the actual merge. Okay. So in fact, many projects that kind of are built in this way, the maintainers of the application, you know, like the people who own it, right? They don't actually have commit rights on the repo. Okay. Like they have some admin account that does, right? Of course. Uh, but they don't, they can't actually merge a PI. Okay. It has to be done by the bots. Make sense? All right. So that can be really important over the long term. Uh, and yeah. So hopefully that's more legible. All right. We it looks like we had one person get that correct. All right. What is a linter? These are also very long. I mostly boosted the questions from the internet. So thank you, internet stranger. Uh, if anybody needs to, there's also a few seats up there if you want to move on. Uh, and I will pause long enough for you to do so. All right. So a linter, it tells you where you're fixed your code to comply with style guides. So who knows what lint is in the real world, not in tech? Any idea what the word lint means? Yeah, so when you get like cat hair or you get like, you know, pills from like a shirt or whatever, um, that's lint, okay? That, you know, when you dig deep in your pocket, uh, you know, or your couch cushions, lint, right? So they make a, a device that is like basically tape on a stick. It's called a delinter, right? And so you roll it on stuff and it takes the lint off. So what is a linter? It discovers the lint for you, but because it's code and not cat hair, it can't clean it up for you. So that's why it's not a delinter. And that's where the term comes from. So if you ever see it again, that's what, what it means. Uh, but it looks like we did pretty well on that one. Uh, so oh, for anybody who was a little later, um, if, oh wait, no, I said that already. Never mind. All right, uh, Harry is still going strong. Which of these is not a common stage in a CI pipeline? Lint formatting of code, add documentation describing the changes, run unit tests, and building binaries. All right. Humans are required. Right for the add documentation part. Whenever you're doing a commit or PR, kind of related, usually it's the same text, but you should be describing what you're doing. Okay, um, everything else can be done by a computer. All right, ah, there we go. I love it when it changes. All right, which of these isn't a GitHub event? So if you've done the reading, this was in there. All right, maybe I should uh, say uh, the winner may get a prize. So we'll see. All right, so pull, pull request is, but obviously, why do you think pull is not a uh, event? It's, it's human, right? Like there's too much human involvement. So you don't really want that trigger, right? You have like to do a pull. Um, so, All right, no change. All right, what does YAML stand for? Uh, sorry, yet another markup language. YAML ain't a markup language. You're in a your awesome markup language. Uh, YAML, another markup language. I will say I'm disappointed in this one um, because the correct answer is yet another markup language. Um, so what kind of acronym, if this was correct, what kind of acronym would it be? Does anyone know what that's called? My favorite kind of acronym. A recursive acronym, it's called. Okay, so basically when the acronym is included in the acronym like expansion, it's called a recursive acronym. Does anybody know what the most famous recursive acronym is? 
GNU, right? So GNU is not Unix, all right? So GNU is basically the origin of most open source software. Like, like that was the first big project where technically it's an organization that has a bunch of projects. But uh, the other, does anybody know another big common example if you are a Python developer? I will say I learned this one very recently. Uh, PIP. Does anybody know what PIP stands for? You know what PIP is, right? The, okay. Uh, yeah, PIP stands for PIP installs packages. So, like I said, I love recursive acronyms. I have a very, very simplistic sense of humor. All right. Oh, changes. But Harry's still holding on, though. All right. Uh, so this is kind of like how how are your um, uh, you know deployment tool chain or whatever how are they being uh, in parallel serially both or neither? All right. So the correct answer is both. Okay. However, uh, you almost always want to favor serially. Okay, anybody know why you want to favor serially? All right, so because parallelism is confusing, okay? So unless it's going to make a real impact to like the performance of the deployment or build structure or whatever you're going to do, try to favor serially, just like you should do in your code. Introducing parallelism or recursion is fun and interesting and common in, I think, academic programming. Terrible idea, as much as possible in proper software engineering. Okay. Recursion and parallelism are both really good under certain cases, but you should only use them in those cases. Okay. So, like, think about it really hard before you introduce that into your code because of the number of bugs and confusion and everything else that results. Yes? Yeah, I would also add that if your jobs are independent and you know for a fact that they're independent, you can probably run them uh, in parallel. Well, that's kind of my point. So, so there is often a good reason to do it. Uh, just you want to make sure you have a good reason. The, a good reason is not it would be cool or it's going to shave 10 seconds off, right? Um, you know, unless it's a 13 second process, right? Um, so just think about it carefully whenever you want to introduce parallelism or recursion into, you know, kind of any sort of software development stuff, uh, because it just, it, it has so many headaches associated with it that be careful of it. Uh, this is my classic example too of this. How many, did any of you uh, do a class where you had a code in assembly? They, yeah, okay. So they tell you in assembly, right? Don't use go to. Okay, it's the same thing, except sometimes when you need it, right? Uh, so using go to is usually a bad idea, um, but sometimes it makes sense. <clears throat> All right, next we have where do you store the YAML files that make your workflows if you're doing uh, GitHub deployment stuff? Uh, GitHub slash action, git, um, drop the dot, the git slash action, GitHub slash workflows, git slash workflows. All right. This is a common mistake. However, what I will tell you, don't write stuff in dot git ever, okay? Um, except that I think Git hooks go there. So that is one use case where you should. But generally speaking, let git manage dot git. Okay. There are even, uh, so there's a file in there called dot git config that you can manually edit or whatever, but you shouldn't. You should use the git commands that will edit it for you. Okay. So because GitHub is doing something special, uh, you know, that is a service of GitHub, has nothing to do with Git. That's why it lives in GitHub workflows. Make sense? So if you're tempted to go into .git, you're probably making a, a huge mistake. Although, actually, sorry, I meant to bring up. Does anybody know what git, git hooks are? So git hooks are very convenient. Uh, normally, the way I get new git hooks is by Googling git hook for blah, and then finding somebody's gist or something, and then stealing their thing. 
Um, but what they do is basically they fire on anything that you did in Git. Okay, so if you do a Git commit, for example, uh, one of the examples that I used to use it for is uh, a bunch of the projects I contributed to required signed commits. So does anybody know what a signed commit is? So basically there's another flag on commit that lets you sign it and it basically inserts your signing information into the commit to prove who did it. Um, and I would always forget the flag. So what I did was I wrote a hook that would on commit sign it for me or fix, fix my commit with a signature. Um, another common example is actually tie it to your unit testing framework so that every time you do a commit, it actually runs all your unit tests. So they can be really handy, uh, worth looking into if you use Git a lot. Um, and if you don't, you should. So. All right. Uh, I have never actually played this game. There is one imposter among us. So which of these things is not like the rest of them, even though they claim to be? Oh, but let's do GitHub. Oh, it's good. All right, Docker Hub. Why is Docker Hub not like the rest of them? You can't it really, all 13 of you got this on blind guessing. All right, so Docker Hub is a place that you can store and like kind of, and then deploy containers, okay? It will build them and then uh, offer them available to others. However, Docker Hub has been falling off quite a bit because they started charging for the service. Uh, they started putting a lot of gates into the service. Uh, so it's becoming increasingly uh, less useful. Um, and to freely pitch my former employer, um, there's an alternative service called Quay, or Quay.io, which does very much the same thing. So basically on like Git commits, for example, or pushes really into like a GitHub repo, uh, it will build a container engine, you know, a container file for you and then offer it up to the public. You can also have private ones. It's free up to a certain level. Uh, so it's, uh, and it's also all open source. Um, so it's, uh, it's kind of cool. It's a good alternative. Um, if the Docker hub is getting on your nerves, which is, if it's not, you probably aren't using it enough, um, or you're paying for it. Um, so, but the funny thing about Quay is the, it's spelled Q-U-A-Y. Okay. Does anybody know what this word is? Q-U-A-Y in English. All right. It's pretty uncommon. So it means like a dock. Okay, like, you know, like a boat dock, except that it's actually pronounced key. Um, however, I didn't learn this until about five years ago because the only way I ever had seen the word was written. And so I pronounced it in my head as quay, right? Uh, then I was in a meeting and I was very embarrassed by someone correcting me and telling me that it's pronounced key. Then I was in a later meeting, literally the same day with the developers who built quay and told them, why don't you call it key? And they said, because we like quay better. <laughs> and I was like, oh. so, uh, so the word is key. That particular uh, application is pronounced quote. All right. Multi slide. All right. What is the use of coveralls? Uh, let's see, generating coverage report, analyzing coverage reports, ask bill status in GitHub, and all of the other. I'm disappointed that you know, holding your hammer while you're on your tractor is not. All okay, so uh, I didn't really expect you to know this one. It's more, it was uh, an opportunity for me to bring up another subject. Um, does anybody know what a coverage report is? Okay, so it's talking about test coverage. Does anybody know what, what we mean by test coverage? So one of the stats that you should probably be pulling on a given software engineering project is what is the coverage of the tests of your code? So in other words, is, are your tests unit, usually unit tests, uh, are what percentage of your code is actually being tested? The goal in some magic mystical world is 100%. That is very unlikely, very, very hard to do. Um, so usually I would say 80%, somewhere north of 80% typical. 
Um, however, it's one of those things kind of like the team agreement in the sense that you should agree to whatever that number should be. And if that number falls below uh, that number, then you should like investigate, right? There should be a piece of work to go and fix that and get your test coverage back up. Um, so going up is usually fine, but going down is not. And it's good. It's another good way to kind of manage the health of your project is that if your test coverage starts dropping off, it probably means something something's going on that is not cool. Like one of your new developers is not writing tests. It's a typical one. All right. All right, which of these is not a stage in Travis CI? This should be entertaining because I bet most of you don't know what Travis is. Okay, so um, to be honest, I don't really care what the answer is. Uh, everybody know what Travis is? All right, so Travis is a tool that's been around for about 10 years, um, predates GitHub Actions, predates a lot of that stuff. Uh, and what it does is continuous uh, integration uh, and kind of continuous deployment uh, in a very, very nice way. So basically you drop a dot Travis file into your GitHub repo um, and kind of configure Travis. And it will then build, uh, it used to be primarily virtual machines, now they have containers and stuff, but it'll build all that and run tests for you. Okay, so which can be really, really useful if you want to do what we were talking about before. So whenever a PR comes in, you can run, you can have it set up so that Travis will just automatically pull the code, run the tests, and then give a report back into the PR. Uh, so super handy. Um, kind of starting to be less uh, common because of GitHub Actions and some other competitors, um, but still does things that GitHub Actions do not. Okay. Um, and I also mentioned it because uh, when I, within the first like year or so, I was at Red Hat while Travis was still very small. I said Red Hat should buy them. Uh, they did not, and uh, they uh, they should have bought them. Let's just put it that way. They were, they were a big deal for a long time. Uh, and it would have been great for the community to have that open source because they never open sourced it either. And it had a negative impact on the Fedora community, but we can talk about that some other time. Let's see, can I click buttons? There we go. All right. What does CD stand for? Uh, so it does say multi select. I don't know that all of the selections are required, or if you just select one and there's multiple gray answers. Yeah, exactly. All right, so from a CD, right, is that it both means continuous deployment and continuous delivery. Um, and there's more questions later about the difference between those two. So I'm not going to talk about that. All right. Oh, I love it when it changes. All right, your Travis environment variables, I explained what that was, should be secret. So think about this question in terms of who cares if it's Travis environment variable to your application. Should they be secret? In other words, not checked into GitHub. Okay, so both of these answers are correct. All right, so basically environment variables are where your secrets typically go. Okay, so you know, your you know, whatever Amazon key, you know, your whatever other keys. Um, so generally speaking, what I do with anything that is setting environment variables is I have them set up as um, as secret. So in other words, I in my git config, I will take, you know, let's just say it's, a, you know, config.m or something is the format I use. I'll say, um, get, you know, get ignore on config.m. Um, but then I will always also have a config.m.sample, which will have blank values for all the keys that I put in. 
so that I, mostly for me, so I remember what variables are available. Um, and then I check the sample in, but then keep the, uh, you know, keep the real answers private. That makes sense? All right, one of the problems that introduces is that how do you distribute those things to your team, okay? And so uh, the most common way that people use, which is really bad, is email, because email is unencrypted, so you're just sending it in the clear, is the first problem. Another common way is to use something like Slack, which arguably is a little better, um, but then there's also tools like, um, what are they called? Uh, Vagrant, is that the name of the company? Oh, so there's a, there's a product called Vault, uh, and there's a couple of competitors as well as the one I'm thinking of uh, that actually does key management for you uh, that both your, that your application can actually read. Um, and so getting your environment variables actually out of a file and into something like that is actually a better choice. What, what is Vagrant's company called? It's totally blank. All right. How often should you be deploying to production with continuous deployment? Oh, sorry. Uh, there is no set standard on every code commit, every six months, and every week. All right, so the correct answer is that it depends, basically. So there is no set standard. There is no right answer to this. One thing I will tell you, though, is something like every week is usually a bad idea. And the reason is, is because invariably, you will catch at least one person off guard okay, when that job kind of goes through and automatically commits. And somebody was sick that day, or their kid interrupted what they were doing, or something, and they left a bug, right? that they knew about and could have fixed if they'd had a little bit more time. Um, but the best version, in my opinion, is every code commit, but really every like merge, okay? Um, so that's the best way because then I, as the, the producer of that piece of, of that code, am kind of saying, yes, this is ready, you know? Uh, and so therefore it's, I think this is the safest solution um, with, the feature set of continuous deployment. All right. So what encourages good coding practices and early detection of integration problems? Continuous delivery, orchestration, monitoring, or continuous integration? What is the term for that stuff? All right, mm -hmm. continuous integration is the correct answer. All right, what is continuous delivery as distinct from continuous deployment? All right, so personally, I think this, this one's arguable. Basically, I, I think a lot of this, the terminology is still really slippery, um, but this is what a lot of people mean by it, okay? Is that there is, you know, kind of a commit, which should be the what's called the head of your main branch or your trunk that is always deployable, okay? Um, so, and that's, it doesn't have to necessarily be deployed, but it is deployable. So in other words, when you push that bad piece of code, you have a way to roll back. All right. What are small, loosely coupled services that make up a larger application call? The answer is not service-oriented architecture, even though it's the same thing. All right, microservices, so you got that right. 
I kind of want serverless services to be a thing because there's so many S's in there. <laughs> All right, so which practice helps you quickly identify problems in production? So which of these continuous integration, orchestration, monitoring, and microservices <clears throat> helps you quickly identify problems in production? Job. All right, so we got monitoring. All right, does anybody know why the term monitoring is actually a little bit of a misnomer here? Any theories? Because most of the time, you don't actually care about the monitoring, you care about anomalies in the monitoring, right? So you got to think about the fact that you're putting the monitoring in place because you want to detect change, okay? So if you kind of keep that in the back of your mind when you're thinking about monitoring, it can lead to better results in a sense, right? Because you're not, you know, the goal, it's kind of like, uh, actually, I, I had a, a professor in college uh, who dinged me really hard on a pro like project or homework or something, I can't remember, uh, because I didn't put enough comments in my code, right? So the next one, I commented every line of code. And then he dinged me for too many comments in my code. Um, so, what you want to keep in mind with monitoring, it's very easy to say we have to monitor everything, right? But that's not actually what you care about, right? What you care about is noticing change, okay? Particularly bad change, but you kind of want to notice good change as well um, because they kind of go hand in hand. So just kind of keep that in mind because like I said, the temptation to monitor all the things is very high. And, it, and it's an expensive operation, right? That's why you don't want to do it. All right, almost done. What is the process that automatically compiles files files into a usable form called build automation, orchestration, monitoring, or continuous deployment? Right, build automation it is, exactly what it sounds like. All right, oh, Erickson on fire. All right, what does infrastructure as code mean? Uh, going serverless, manually setting up servers, managing infrastructure using code and automation, and auto scaling are your choices. All right, good job. That was pretty good. Um, so we know why managing infrastructure as code is a good idea. What does it let you do? All right, it always goes back to Git. If you can manage your infrastructure as code, right, then you can check it into Git. Then when you have a problem, you can find out what changed, okay? So imagine, right, you're in AWS land, right, and you're clicking around in all the different places or whatever, and all of a sudden the thing you were working on just stopped working. What was the last thing you clicked? Or more importantly, what did you click six clicks ago? That's a pain to figure out, okay? However, if you had written in, you know, albeit ugly as sin, YAML file, at least you put it all in there, right? And then you tried something and it seemed to be still working, but it wasn't quite what you wanted. And then you should try it again, wasn't quite what you wanted. And hey, guess what? Now you can roll back to an old commit when you completely destroy the thing, right? This is why those zesty user interfaces for things like Amazon or whatever are often a very bad idea, right? You're much better off trying to find a way to like write the answer and put it somewhere that you can, you know, basically do diffs on Git or something equivalent. Uh, all right, I think there's another question about this later. All right, what is orchestration? I know I've explained this before. So collecting data about performance and production, automation that supports processes and workflow, scheduling deployments to go out at the right time, and stability.
Okay, so automation is sports processes and workflows. Major example here is Kubernetes. Um, is basically probably the hottest project out there in the open source world right now, uh, and basically does orchestration. And if you don't remember me explaining this before, imagine a conductor in an orchestra. The conductor says, violins, your turn, <laughs> cellos, your turn. Um, that's what orchestration is, it is basically something that's being the conductor, okay? Because when you talk about like microservices and you literally have, you know, two or 300 services that are all running around doing their thing, in your, you know, whatever application, keeping track of that as a human is just a non-start, okay? So instead we use tools like Kubernetes to manage it for us. And let's see what's next. All right. All right, what is a benefit of configuration management? Related question, which isn't here, but I'll say it in a minute. Frequent deployments, maintainability, stability, and none of the above. Um, and do you know what configuration management means? All right, maintainability. So configuration management is basically the tools that let you do infrastructure as code. So I would say that the probably the most popular one is this one called Puppet. Uh, Ansible is one from my former employer that's kind of going like this. Uh, there's another really common one called Chef, which is kind of going like this. Um, so those are some of the big configuration management tools. What you're seeing also increasingly is um, the various cloud vendors distributing their own configuration management tools. Um, many, they're, like I actually haven't looked into this, but many of them are called like cloud formation that I think are actually all based on a general standard, but they all kind of are slightly different or whatever. So those are also configuration management. And basically, you know, it's like I can write that YAML file all day, right? But I gotta have something that actually makes it like go, right? Uh, another common one is uh, Terraform, uh, which is similar, um, but yeah. So there's something else I was gonna say about that. What was the prior question? Oh, Kubernetes. So Kubernetes now, uh, so from an orchestration perspective, it primarily works with containers, but now it actually covers virtualization as well. So you can actually manage like virtual machines and containers all into like one application or whatever. And the reason I bring it up again is because Tuesday, my Twitch show is interviewing some of the um, maintainers for the virtualization part inside Kubernetes, if you're interested in that sort of stuff. <laughs> I think that's the end.